my experience with people is we're incredibly resilient. And when once we've been able to frame a challenge in a way that we can see how we can somehow we can bring out our best, now we have a path forward and we can start doing that. And adrenaline that comes along just makes it easier, in fact, to stretch ourselves and to learn. So I tend to be very optimistic. So I don't mind if there might be a lot of anxious people out there, but it's growth waiting to happen. Before we get started, if you enjoy these episodes, you might want to check out more at optimwork.com. Our website offers unique content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond. We have an in-depth masterclass covering our entire theory of growth, daily recommendations for personalized advice, and a platform to help groups and organizations learn and practice optimal work together. You can get a free trial at optimwork.com. Now let's start the episode. Hey, this is Sharif here with another episode of the Optimal Work Podcast, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Hey, Kevin, good to be back here with you again after a little bit of a break. Yeah, Sharif, it's great to be back. Yeah, Kevin, well, uh, we recently reviewed Bad Therapy by Abigail Schreier, and that was a great episode. Um, and I thought we could continue with another review of, of a book that has also been making waves and is related to psychology and the modern world, and that's Jonathan Heights, the the anxious generation. I almost said the bad generation, but the, the anxious generation. <laughs> Confused. Yes. Uh, how's that sound to you? Sounds great. Yeah, two very different books. Yeah, yeah. And two very different authors. So Jonathan Heights is a social psychologist, and he uh, made a name for himself with the book The Coddling of the American Mind. And this is going deeper into the social psychology, showing how are children doing post, I don't know, the last 15 years or so. So, and, and looking into all that research. So he, he's, he has a lot of findings, which are interesting. Yeah. And he seems to be very squarely within the CBT tradition. I, he's very pro CBT, I think. Yeah. He's very pro CBT. He doesn't practice it himself. Uh, but he is familiar with it as a as a way of treating people. Okay, well, maybe we can just dive into his kind of diagnosis. I guess he sees that there are skyrocketing levels of anxiety, especially among youth right now. So that it starts with kind of gener Gen Z, uh, which is I guess people born after 1995. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so this is people who have more or less had a, ha, have had access to smartphones throughout their childhood, uh, and this causes pr causes problems. I guess is that right? <laughs> That's the claim. He puts a lot of the blame for how people are doing, young people, totally on smartphones. Not all of it, but a huge amount of it is on smartphones because that's what changed. He's looking particularly at a time from 2010 to 2015. Because you can look at how anxious are people, how depressed are people, how much suicidal behavior do they have. And it's, rel it's relatively a flat line until you get to 2010. And then everything, all psychopathology starts increasing in 2010. So in fact, if there is one weakness with the book, it's that it's not really about the anxious generation. It's like the depressed, unhappy, failing to thrive generation. Uh, because particularly with boys, it shows up very differently than with girls. So with girls, you do see, in, in both, there are rises in anxiety and, and depression. Uh, but with boys, it often takes the form of what he calls a failing to launch, that, the, that young men are just not getting jobs or getting into education. They're kind of dropped out of, you know, and they're, they're living in their parents' homes still and uh, now, so I think he's looking at that whole failing to thrive that you, that you see with young people. And it wasn't just the United States. It, it's the entire English-speaking world and beyond. So he thinks that that's why the changing um, landscape of technology and how we know for sure how teams were using it then, uh, that is, he thinks, uh, the best explanation for what's changing the mental health landscape. So, yeah, maybe we could get briefly into what exactly is the problem with smartphones, at least on, on his view. Um, I think a lot of people 
probably have the sense like you know, screens are bad, they're artificial, and then mm-hmm. you know you have access to the internet on your phone. It's so, but and so people have a general sense. Okay, smartphones cause problems, but maybe they don't, or we don't understand exactly why. How how much of it of there is there a sense that okay, we know exactly why smartphones are a problem? Like, w- what do you think? What does Jonathan Haidt think? There is compelling data that there's a causal link between girls, particularly under age, like 14, using social media and developing anxiety and depression. So there's, so there are, and so he's you know, reviewed the data and he says it's a strong, it's not just a correlation that we can actually show causation. Uh, so there is, I think, a very good argument. I think this book is fundamentally non-controversial. I don't think you're going to be finding, you know, large groups of people or, or certain types of professions having a problem with this book. It seems like everyone kind of admits that, in fact, uh, people, y- young brains are being exposed to social media and to screens, and that means video games and pornography, uh, at incredibly early ages. And that that has a really detrimental effect, and so so I think that in a sense it's really non-controversial. But if a parent is considering you know, whether they should give children, you know, the uh, you know a smartphone, uh, they should read this book before at least make an informed decision to see what are the risks, and then getting into the question of why is our smartphones causing this problem. So uh, you would highlight that element of, of social media. Um, I guess you, you said, especially for girls, for um, girls. So I guess there, there are problems kind of across the board. There's, you know, potential moral problems with having a smartphone. There's kind mm-hmm. of psychological problems that are caused by tapping in so frequently to a mm-hmm. kind of virtual world. There are social problems with social media, bullying, like getting an, uh, a uh, kind of unrealistic picture of what other people's lives look like and trying to imitate that. Um, and then are, are there also co- cognitive problems associated with interacting always with a kind of unreal environment as opposed to the real world? Yeah, so we, he, he has, he lists four issues. The first is social disconnection. If you're spending five hours a day on the screen, you aren't really forming relationships around you. So in schools, what you see is the zombification of the hallway. Yeah. So you know, I remember when I was in high school, uh, the hallways were very lively. Everyone's talking to each other all the time. Before class starts, everyone's talking to each other. That's all changed. So, and most schools claim that they don't allow cell phones in school, but what they really mean is they don't allow it in class. And that what that means is because they have it on their person, they will be looking at it during class, and then especially they use it in between classes. So that's where it just cuts out the normal social interaction. And you can see differences in schools in a lot of these variables in terms of how kids are thriving based on do they have a total policy of no smartphones at all in the school day, or is it just during class that it's prohibited? That's a big difference. So in fact, there's you don't see the same anxiety and depression rates when kids just aren't allowed to use the smartphone at school. Before we continue, a brief message. If you're benefiting from these discussions, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Doing so helps us to reach more people. So you're not just learning, you're also helping others to discover a path of growth and flourishing. Thanks for your support. Okay, great, Kevin. So beyond then the social effects, which kind of reminds me of, you know, commuting to work and everyone on the train or the bus is is on their phones. I guess that's what now a high school hallway would look like, which is kind of scary. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, apparently I never, I haven't been in high school for a long time, but yes, yeah, so that's what they're saying. <laughs> I just remember, you know, kids slamming each other into the lockers and stuff. Maybe that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> yes. Uh, in so, fact, all of that kind of stuff, has gone way down. Well, that's good. There's these, it's like alarming data about how um, young men aren't going to the emergency room anymore from having done silly things because <laughs> they're just on screens. And so there's no reason yeah. you go to the emergency room for that. 
But it used right. to be that it was just typical that a huge part of the emergency rooms was dealing with young men who had overextended themselves and broken something. Well, at least that has gone way down. But the price was pretty high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then uh, going, then you said you mentioned four social being the first uh, kind of problem or risk or something. Uh, what would be the other ones? So then the next is sleep deprivation. So children need at least eight hours sleep at night. And one great way of making them anxious and depressed is depriving them consistently of, the, of sleep. So they generally have to wake up early because they have school. So that means that they really do need to get to bed to allow them at least eight hours actually sleeping. And younger kids, it's more closer to nine, eight and a half or nine. And so eight should be seen for anyone all the way through high school as the minimum amount of sleep that, that's needed. And we know that when they have access to screens in their room, then they stay up much later. And so many kids are spending a lot of extra time. So in fact, now they're getting six hours on average or seven hours, but it's not enough. So if you want to get stuck in threat mode, well, all of that extra time awake makes it so much harder to get out of it. You need the long periods of sleep to get out of threat mode. The uh, third is just the, in the attentional deprivation, that they're uh, not able to attend to their work as long as they used to be able to. They get pinged constantly. Uh, and And... The numbers, when you look at the average number of notifications they might get a day, the typical teen, he, he cites some number close to 200 as a rough estimate of how many notifications they get. And many of them even have it set that when they get emails, they get a, a vibration and that can make it much higher. So all these apps are constantly notifying them of, of, of things and then they're getting text messages and WhatsApp. And so it's just constant interruption. So there needs to also be greater sensitivity to protecting attention. And then the last is addiction. Uh, so with boys and girls, you're seeing addiction to screens. Uh, with boys, it tends to be video games and pornography. With girls, it tends to be social media. Uh, but in fact, you do, there are, you know, I think that this is getting to be non-controversial. It's widely recognized that they kids feel like they're being a, hollowed out. One of the kids in the book describes that he feels like he has a hollowed out operating system. So he's just, he's just like, he's vacant on the inside and he's constantly being entertained by the screen. So there's the, there's the addiction issue. So all of that together says that uh, we uh, are setting kids up to have problems. If we allow them to have phones too early, uh, and to social media accounts too early, that these things are best delayed. So as long as possible. Yeah. And I think just maybe one more point to make on his diagnosis before we can shift towards his recommendations and then your recommendations and your thoughts on mm -hmm. his recommendations. Um, he also talks uh, a lot about, well, there's this, you know, one part about, um, their exposure to the digital world and smartphones and all that stuff. But then he also talks about um, the fact that kids are not engaging in the real world, or if they are, they're kind of overprotected. So he really wants people to be, you know, you have kids like having fun outside, spending time away from parents, kind of on adventures, unsupervised, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit to that and, and how that's working. Yeah, he thinks that there was a miscalculation made by America, basically, you know, and, and it was a very common thing that we became hyper-focused on the threat posed to children by strangers. So I remember the 1980s and uh, yeah, when the movie Adam came out, I believe it was called Adam. Uh, it, it's about the son of John Walsh, who went on to create the uh, America's Most Wanted, which is one of the longest running shows ever. Uh, and once that story, which is a horrific story uh, of this boy who got kind of, um, he disappeared at a mall, uh, and, uh, and yeah, they, they, 
so it's, it's, I won't go into details. It's, it's a terrible story. Um, it shocked the nation and parents everywhere got very scared. And it showed, it was first in 1980, I think it was three that it came out and then 84, 85. And he started seeing all these missing pictures on milk cartons and all over the place. And there, you started to think that in fact, this is a very unsafe place to be. So 1980s, you first started to see the movement of doubting whether it's good for kids to be without adult supervision outside of their house. So back before all, all the, this kind of scare happened, uh, which we're still living in the effects of it, before that happened, I remember being like five years old and, and going to the park by myself to join friends who were there. I remember my mom would whistle when it was time to come home. Now we had this huge park in, you know, next to us and uh, there was a huge pool. There is a, a five meter high dive that there's, I think, no height limit. You could just go off it whenever you could climb up the, uh, five meters is really tall for, for a high dive. And it was such a formative experience having these dangerous things to do that, uh, and there's, a, you know, so there's all these things that the, even the park near a house was dangerous. You know, there's, you know, these monkey bars that are very high off the ground with live crocodiles underneath waiting to eat you. It's very scary. Uh, but, uh, no, sorry. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that's what, it was, that's what, it, that's what it felt like, but we could go there and I could ride my bike there and, and come back walking. And so there is the sense that, you know, I grew up with a very free range childhood. It was also a neighborhood with tons of children, like all there's kids everywhere all the time. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a very safe neighborhood, but that gradually went away. And, and now it's illegal in many places to let children under the age of 10 or even later sometimes be walking by themselves in a neighborhood. So that's a, that's a really big change. So that now, even if parents want to um, let their child do an errand on their own when they're say nine years old, in many places, they, 911 could be called and they'd have child protective services. So America has institutionalized being overprotective and now it's in the law. And so it's not easy for a family to resist it. So he, he, has, he has good ideas in the book uh, and, and he teams up with some others like Peter Gray uh, to, in the latter part of the book to give, to give suggestions about what can be done. But, uh, but so parents became very protect, overprotective about real life threats. Then at the same time, screens you know, got more interesting. And then the nineties, you had the internet, high speed internet eventually, and then fast forward to the smartphones. So it became a way then of keeping children safe as if they're on a screen, they're safe. And parents were incredibly laissez-faire about what their children are seeing on screens. So, and they just assumed that their kids wouldn't get into anything bad. And then not seeing what the other kids are texting, what links are being sent, what images are being sent. Um, so there's this weird combination of being overprotective for real risks and underprotective for digital risks. And it's that combination that that's his ultimate argument, that that's what's led to the current issues that we have. The children have been unprotected from social media, video game, pornography interests. Uh, and it would be the, in some ways, the simplest thing to address that is to have systems in place for verifying age. So right now the, the age of adulthood on the internet is 13. And we know for sure that that is completely unenforced. And so, uh, and it looks like some of these companies are really targeting children down to age four. So they call it the race to the bottom, but they're trying to see like who can go earlier and earlier to create lifelong users. And the only way that you can really counteract that is by having legislation. So, and the UK is starting to have some of this. Uh, they're leading the way in, on, on, on many things about protecting children from online risks. Um, but it wouldn't be that hard for us to make it a hard test of verification. There's ways of using blockchain or using other IDs that you could verify that in fact, without giving away privacy, that, uh, that the person is in fact this age. 
But then he also thinks that the age has to be raised to 16. That he thinks the minimum age for social media, uh, I don't know what he's, he doesn't really talk about video games in that context, uh, is, is 16. So he thinks that when kids go to high school, they can get a smartphone, but it shouldn't yet have social media. They shouldn't have their own social media accounts until they're 16. And do you mention that the the minimum age for smartphones you think should be, or he thinks should be even lower than that, right? So smartphones, um, well, high school is like age 14. So once you're in ninth grade, um, but primarily to be used for one-on-one -on -one types of texting, to text friends, to text parents, to be coordinating schedules. But that uh, when it comes to social media, where now it's one to many, so you can post things that are seen by many people, you can be followed by strangers. You can be, there's there's a lot of real risk actually. And you're creating a online persona that is not easy to delete. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and so you need, children actually need like to be protected from their own mistakes that they could make online that could come back and haunt them. I mean, there are cases that uh, bad therapy talked about that, you know, of universities rescinding their acceptances because of social media posts from years before. So it's like kids shouldn't be navigating a world where you can have permanent records like that. You know, and and also there's just a lot of there's a lot of problems with having with socializing through social media. It's not really social media, it's more anti social media. Yeah, it seems like in this book challenge is a big theme, which I think we that's a theme of ours as well mm -hmm. is that in the the kind of real physical world that's and with re, actually dealing with real people that's where you get a lot of challenges physical social and emotional but then in this digital world it's almost like everything is just passive so you you don't really get a chance to be challenged and to grow um mm -hmm. But so you wouldn't characterize these risks that people face online as challenges. So you wouldn't say, oh, there are these risks to social media and these risks to phones. Therefore, that's a challenge and they're good things. You, you don't see it that way. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see social media as work. And work is how challenges bring out our best. You have to work the challenge. You have to be able to put order into it to see what's the highest goal we can aim for in this challenge. That's the reframe. So you have to be able to see, like, how can this challenge bring out my best? We Could people, like, treat interactions on social media in such a way that they bring out their best? Yes, they can. It's just not the dominant tone on social media. And you're subjecting them unnecessarily to what really is, like, it's so easy to make a mistake on social media and to have people hate you, you know, and to, and to, to be disowned by so-called friend groups, where it's just in normal life, in real life, ruptures can be repaired. Social media ruptures cannot be repaired. You would have to let, so if you offend a bunch of people and now they hate you, it's like, well, that's just going to, you have to have like a new, at some point, then you come up with a new persona. Well, that doesn't really help us in real life. One of the things about children playing and having more free time, which is like one of his huge things, is more free play, is then they have to use their imagination, they have to coordinate each other, and when there are ruptures, they have to be repaired. And all of that is key for the emotional maturing of the kids. That they realize they can't just vent, they can't always be angry, they can't, always, they can't be difficult. It's not about who can say the nastiest thing and have everyone jump on and agree with that. Because that doesn't work when you're playing a game. So, so in a way, he thinks that one of the most important forms of work for children is learning how to work together while playing. And so we have to find ways of facilitating that. That's great. Yeah, that's great. I love the tie-in to bonds and relationships with others in this context. Um, great. I, Mm -hmm. Kevin, are there any other recommendations of his that stand out to you or, or recommendations of your own that you want to highlight for people? No, I think there are things that can be done. You know, one is for parents who are concerned, the number one thing is to see if the school can agree to having a no phone at school policy. 
so that they don't allow them to be used even in between classes. That seems to have great data behind it. It's a simple solution. It can be enacted locally. You just need parents to get together and, and try to do that. Also, that parents try to like be coordinating with each other to agree to be waiting on smartphones and to be waiting on, on social media. That especially for girls, social media is so dangerous if, it, if, it, if it's too young. So I think all of that is, he also has these, there are these really great things about how do you bring back more play. So for instance, you can't like just go back to the 1980s or the 1950s and how, you know, there's all these neighborhoods and kids could just play outside. But a lot of the gains can be gotten just by having free play time in schools, you know, like after, after school for a certain number of hours. So kids can play together. There could be an adult there just to make sure no one physically gets hurt, but not to intervene in any way. And so there are, apparently there's, there's data that that in itself does help kids to be less anxious, just being able to play together with others for like a certain time. And others, some schools have tried it and found it to be, they had really impressive statistics about how their, uh, like the truancy went down, principal office visits went down, all of these kinds of you know, ways of delinquency, everything went down just by having this kind of time. Bullying went down. There's, there's, so it's really impressive to see. I mean, parents can find schools that have unsupervised, mostly unsupervised play afterwards. If they can find schools that have wooded areas or you know, good natural settings, that's of course the ideal. So if that, but not everyone can do that. But if, if possible, to find these more nat nature-based schools, and typically they don't allow phones at all during the day. Yeah, it's, it seems very important that parents and you know families that they're friends with and that their kids might be friends with that they're all more or less on the same page because mm -hmm. it's if your child is the only one without a smartphone, it's going to be really tough to to keep that up. Um, okay, Kevin, I just have one last question for you uh, for optimal work. Mm -hmm we put ideals front and center. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we, we often talk about smartphone usage and internet usage and you know email, social media, and that sort of thing, but we don't necessarily put it central. So um, it seems like for Jonathan Haidt, I, I, I wonder how the idea or the, you know, the concept of ideals might be, how it relates to his discussions here um, and how, how it might you know, complement or supplement his approach. Certainly ideals are the perfect way to reframe any challenge. If you can find a way to live an ideal in a challenge, you now have a goal and you can work it. So you can start then take practical steps towards that ideal. I think that the... Uh, there's a little bit of a danger in equating anxiety or being anxious with being unhappy per se. Anxiety is the body giving us energy in the form of adrenaline so that we can stretch ourselves towards high goals and so that we can work better. So adrenaline is there to actually help us to work better. Ideals give a direction for that. So every ideal that we live is brightened by being lived in a challenge. By trying to live this ideal when it's hard, you make it even better. And then adrenaline, in fact, helps that learning to go more deeply. So I tend to actually have a much more completely positive view of anxiety. And then to see the challenge, because anxiety is the urge to avoid a challenge, but that challenge can bring out our best. And the ideals show us how. So I think that there is, we don't have to like, while I agree with all the demographic stuff and all, all, all you know, all the studies that the Jonathan Haidt is showing, I don't know if we necessarily, um, I'm more optimistic in general that, okay, even if the generation is more anxious, they can work with it, but you're going to actually need to work ideals to really be fulfilled, to really, to really be happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like the complete solution cannot be 
keeping a smartphone or social media away from your kid. I mean, ultimately it has to be about um, helping them to form, yeah. you know, a deep connection to ideals and this kind of resilience that will ultimately help them to engage, um, with, you know, those challenges with challenges with the with the real world with the virtual world more effectively mm -hmm. and to be growing and thriving and yes. And ultimately, every ideal is just a way, in in the highest sense, of, of being loving, being able to actually love and serve others. So when you envision yourself loving and serving those closest to you, you don't envision yourself doing that while looking at a screen. You imagine yourself engaging them and being interested in people and developing bonds with people deliberately. So I think that even if there have been issues with you know like forming bonds, it can be worked on. You know, and so once we deliberately start practicing these things in the face of challenge, we can always have rapid growth. So the wonderful thing is that we can always, I don't think that there's a whole generation. This is my another, another just to mention. He talks about the great rewiring. To, I don't like that because to me, it makes it like as if there's this great rewiring of childhood that occurred from 2010 to 2015. The problem with that is it sounds more permanent than in fact it is. My experience with people is we're incredibly resilient. And when once we've been able to frame a challenge in a way that we can see how we can, somehow we can bring out our best, now we have a path forward and we can start doing that. And adrenaline that comes along just makes it easier, in fact, to stretch ourselves and to learn. So I tend to be very optimistic. So I don't mind if there might be a lot of anxious people out there, but it's growth waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Hey, Kevin, I think that's a very nice, positive note for us to end on here. All right. Thank you, Sharif. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. We'll be back next week. Till next time. Thanks for tuning into today's episode. If you enjoyed our conversation and you're looking for more in-depth guidance, check out OptimWork.com, our unique platform that delivers content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond.